Welcome to Run Tell This and BET present Justice for George Floyd, our special coverage of the murder trial of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. I'm Morris Gevelcampo, joined by Wesley Lowry and Keith Reed. If you don't know us already, please check out our podcast. We are the Run Tell This podcast. We cover news and social justice issues. You can check us out wherever you listen to podcasts and also on social media at Run Tell This underscore. We bring in a special guest now, Nakima Levy Armstrong, an activist at Bright Beam, civil rights attorney and former former Minneapolis NAACP president who was on the scene of some breaking news in the Minneapolis area. Nakima, can you tell us where you are and what's going on? I am here in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, which is about 15 minutes outside of Minneapolis. And we're outside of the police department that killed Dante Wright. 20-year-old Dante Wright was driving in his car. He was talking to his mother on the phone and he was pulled over by police. At the time that he was being pulled over, he told his mother that the police had pulled him over because he had an air freshener hanging from his mirror. And his mother could actually hear him asking the police why he was being pulled over. In the midst of all of that, she said she heard a brief scuffle. They told him to get off the phone. He hung up the phone. And then a few minutes later, his girlfriend who was in the car with him at the time called his mom back and let her know that Dante had been shot. And of course, there was widespread outrage throughout the Twin Cities. He was killed around two o'clock in the afternoon, but his body laid in the streets for five hours. Of course, that just inflamed tensions and, and frustration. When we got here, the police department had turned off all of the lights outside of the building so that you could not see the police very clearly. You couldn't see badge numbers or anything. And they basically gave us a dispersal order telling us that we had 10 minutes to leave the area or we were going to be subjected to arrest. And so we actually went across the street and in the midst of that time, what they did was to um, start using tear gas as well as um, rubber bullets and flashbang grenades against mostly peaceful protesters. Now, Nakima, this obviously happens in the midst of the, of the Derek Chauvin trial. Now, police shootings happen all the time. I covered them for years. There are three people are shot and killed by the police every single day. So even when we're not talking about them, they're happening. But what is the significance of us having one of these moments, another name, another hashtag in greater Minneapolis as this trial is going? Well, our city was already on edge because of the killing of George Floyd, as well as the start of the Derek Chauvin trial a few weeks ago. There's been a lot of trauma because we've had to watch the bystander videos of George Floyd being killed over and over and over again during the trial. It wasn't right. He was, he was suffering. He was in pain. I would have checked his airway. I would have been worried about his a spinal cord injury because he had so much weight on his neck. Yeah, and I'm sitting here talking to, uh, with another off-duty uh, firefighter that just stayed here watching in front of us as well. Okay. And she told him to check the, the main pulse, but they wouldn't even check the, uh, the pulse. And when you couldn't do that, how did that make you feel? Totally distressed. Were you frustrated? Yes. We've also seen the defense counsel attempt to put George Floyd himself on trial for his own death, as well as the blaming of bystanders, most of whom were black, who tried to intervene by asking the officers to remove Derek Chauvin's knee from George Floyd's neck. So, of course, that has caused a lot of tension in the Twin Cities, a lot of stress, as well as, as anxiety. And another police killing was the last thing that we needed. This has really taken us over the edge in terms of not feeling safe, knowing that our system of policing needs to be overhauled with a stronger sense of urgency, and knowing that we're not out of the woods yet in terms of things being explosive here in the Twin Cities. We have tremendous concerns about 
what's going to happen next. While we were out here in front of the police station, we saw tensions being extremely high. And rather than police officers being sensitive to the trauma that the Black community is already facing, they turned up the heat by using excessive force against peaceful demonstrators, which was completely unacceptable. And we demanded immediate change. So since that time, what has happened was that the city manager has actually been fired. The city manager is African-American. And in the city of Brooklyn Center, the city manager is the one who has authority over the police department, not the mayor. And so that has now changed. The mayor has been granted emergency powers. The city council, the um, the city manager has been fired, and now the mayor has authority over the police department. So, so can you take us through that because because your voice was one of the voices that was heard on the the press conference. We are standing in solidarity mm-hmm. and calling for the firing of this officer. Mm-hmm. You have talked about her having due process, mm-hmm. although Dante Wright did not get due process in that situation. She needs to be fired immediately to send a message that this type of behavior will not be condoned within the city of Brooklyn Center. Thank you. I, pre- I appreciate those comments. Can you just bring us through what happened in that press conference? When we showed up at City Hall, we found out after our meeting with, with uh, elected officials that they were going to hold a press conference. They expected us to wait at City Hall while they held their press conference um, inside of the police station. And I said, absolutely not. We are also going to the police department um, when you have your press conference so that we can hear and see everything in real time, including the body camera footage. And so when we got here, they tried to keep us out of the press conference, but somehow we were able to get in there and we were able to ask questions after the journalists who were present um, asked questions. Are there going to be more questions? Why was Dante Wright's body left in the streets for hours yesterday? Okay. Do you understand how dehumanizing that was to have a body lay in the street for five hours? That was a priority of my of my assignment to get him removed from that as soon as possible without disturbing the crime scene so that we wouldn't be accused of tampering with the evidence. Now, it's not unusual, in all honesty, for activists in the Twin Cities to get into press conferences. We have made our way in. We have raised questions that journalists will typically not raise so that we can get to the bottom of things for the people in our community. After we raised our questions in that press conference, we then attended an emergency meeting with the city council members of Brooklyn Center along with the mayor. We got on the record in demanding that the chief of police be fired along with the city manager for their behavior throughout this situation. Nakima, um, I know that you have a lot going on. You are literally there on the ground um, as all this is unfolding. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. He's a New York Times op-ed columnist, the anchor of Prime with Charles Blow on the Black News Channel, and a best-selling author. Charles, thanks so much for being here with us. And the first question I wanted to ask you is, what did you make of Felonious Floyd, George Floyd's brother, and whether or not you think it was wise for the prosecution to wait so long into their presentation before calling him to the stand? Well, I mean, a lot of us are, are coming to understand um, law in this jurisdiction now. Uh, this wouldn't even be testimony in most states. Um, part of the trial, part of the sentencing, you would get kind of uh, testimony mm-hmm. about the person. And the prosecution is trying to overcome all of the privileges that law enforcement walk into that courtroom with. We are trained as a society to look at them as the defenders of law, not the breakers of laws. Uh, and we are also, unfortunately, trained as society to, to force criminality onto Black people, whether they are criminals or not. And all of that has to be overcome. There were a couple of things that I found interesting about this spark of life concept. First of all, I'd never heard of it. So in doing a little bit of research about where this comes from, this stems from a case where the victim was a police officer. Now it's being applied in a case where the defendant is a police officer. But, you know, the other two things that I thought were really interesting here is one, I I have felt that the prosecution has been, since their opening statements, correctly trying to humanize George Floyd because they understand that the the defense is going to paint him as a drug addict and a criminal and try to bring all these things in that are going to dehumanize him and that are so easy for so many people to believe about Black men. But the other thing that that I found most touching um, as a, a human being, as a Black person and as a mother, was that 
Filonis was able to provide some context for what we all saw as George Floyd's last words in calling for his dead mother. And that was what was most powerful to me is that he spoke about how close they were. He spoke about how devoted George was to their mother. That's, that's my mother. She's no longer with us right now, but that's, that's my oldest brother, George. I miss both of them. George, he would always be up on our mom. He was a big mama's boy. Um, I cry a lot, but George, he loved his mom. He went to the funeral. It's just, George just sat there at the casket over and over again. He would just say, mama, mama, over and over again. And I didn't know what to tell him because I was in pain too. We all were hurting. And he was just kissing her and just kissing her. He didn't want to leave the cast. And I don't see how that doesn't have a profound impact on the jury. I, I, am I the only one? Like, it is, there's a part of me that's just furious about that he has to be humanized mm -hmm. rather, than, rather than his existence walking into the court as human. I'm just like, here's the tape. Deliberate. <laughs> You know, like, I, I, what, what are we right. doing? Like, that, there's a part of me that's like, what? I don't understand it. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I get it from a legal perspective. You have to go through all the machinations of a trial. But, you know, there's a part of me like that, that keeps asking, how many people have to emote? Police officers legally get the benefit, get the benefit of the doubt. The prosecution has the burden, the prosecution. So, so those of us who have watched this tape can sit back and say, I don't understand why it is, why they can't, couldn't just play the tape and say, and say the guy's, the guy's guilty. And that might be obvious to us, but to a jury, they're going to be instructed specifically about the prosecution. They, the prosecution absolutely has the burden to, to prove their case. They have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. They have to convince all 12 jurors, whereas the defense only has to convince one juror so all of these things are at play. Listen, I don't want to leave your views with the impression that I don't understand it. I want to leave them with the impression that I am angry and enraged by the necessity by it. of it. You know, uh, the, it, it, a young white girl gets kidnapped. We don't have to humanize her and put all of her family and her neighbors and the people who watched her get kidnapped and God forbid, get, get, forbid killed for her to be a human. But that becomes necessary for a bulking black man with very dark skin. Well, let, let that, me ask you guys. That, a, that let me ask you guys a. Let me ask you guys a question because this is a conversation I've had with my black girlfriends, and I'm curious if men do the same thing. Have you had conversations with your loved ones about what photos they should show if you're ever killed by the police, or if any harm should befall you, to make sure that you're presented in the light you want to be presented in? Well, well, I, I remember my mom telling me once that when myself and my brothers were growing up, one of the reasons she always insisted we were present for school picture day was because if something ever happened, she wanted to make sure there was a good updated photo. I would remind folks that in 2014 in Ferguson, one of the very first national trending topics around this was hashtag uh, when they gun me down. And it was people showing, you know, the mm -hmm. picture of them in the graduation robe and then the picture of them at Halloween or the picture of them out at the club, but then the picture of them doing community service. And they're saying, and the point was basically, which one do you think the media is going to use if and when uh, something happens to me? Let me let me just say this, however. Even if every picture of him showed him in a gang with his pants hanging off of his, his butt and his, shirt, his chest out and him flipping everybody off, he still should not have been killed. I, 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 I know I keep coming back to this, but like the, the idea that we have to, that he has to be perfect in his victimhood is also problematic. It's it is problematic. problematic. But you, but we've come to know that that's how the system works, that you have to be the perfect victim if you're black to expect any semblance of justice. Yes, that, and that is the problem. And, and, and as you were discussing earlier about like 
how you know they had to put on witnesses to show that he this wasn't part of the training. You they can follow the training and still kill you and get away with it. So right. That's something you've actually written about a lot. Can you explain yes. on that a little bit? That it's in legal. most cases, the yeah. reason we're not seeing charges and especially not convictions is because what they're doing is legal. It is legal. The the courts uh primarily but also state and local jurisdictions have given such wide latitude mm -hmm. to police officers that is under their discretion and basically with the argument that they should not be punished for doing this dangerous job and making split second decisions that happen to be mis mistakes and end up with somebody dead that they cannot be held criminally uh, 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 liable for that because they're making a split second decision in a very dangerous situation. And if any other reasonable person could have made that same decision uh, for fear of their life or for any other reason, then they, the police officers have to be granted that same latitude. The knee across Mr. Floyd's neck and the prone restraint were unreasonable, excessive, and contrary to generally accepted police practices no reasonable officer would have believed that that was an appropriate, acceptable, or reasonable use of force. The problem is that in the split seconds, both your conscious mind can be working and your subconscious mind can be working, and the same latitude you might give to one person, you may deny the next. And so that mistake may be more likely to happen with one group of people who look one way than they are likely to happen with someone who looks another way. And so built into that supposition about how police officers will behave is a get out of jail free card for for bias in in many jurisdictions they have it's 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 on the books that police officers don't even have to talk to the investigating body for a certain number of days and it could be 10 days it could be 15 days it could be x number of days so that gives them a, enough time to consult with their lawyer to consult with the other officers on the scene to get there to to talk to whoever they need to talk to to get their story straight Right. So this stuff is is not happening absent context. I'm just I'm I'm so upset, like all the time about it. And, you know, I, I moved out of New York to, to Atlanta because I was like, I got to be in all uh, in a, in a majority of black city. Like I I can't take it anymore. This idea that we have to keep trying to make ourselves presentable, acceptable, do the right things, do it, you know, dress the right way so they don't think you're a suspect. Well, you got enough. On a on a on a military uniform, and you're still dragged out of the car. There, 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 there is no way to make white supremacy treat you well, right? Charles, what what's how do you see the the prosecution's case? How did they do? Do you think they did a good job of heading off what we'll hear from the defense? What's your take on the case they presented? So I'm going to try to put on some sort of legal analyst hat because I you know. Because my thinking is, he was alive when he ran into him. He was dead when they left. They killed him. So that, that's so it's very simple to me. You'll be able to see every part of what Mr. Floyd went through, from him first crying out, from his effort to move his shoulder to get his breathing, to get room to breathe. You'll be able to hear his voice get deeper and heavier, his words further apart, his respiration more shallow. Uh, you'll see him when he goes unconscious. And you'll be able to see the uncontrollable shaking he's doing when he's not breathing anymore, the anoxic seizures from oxygen deprivation. I do believe, however, that they, as these cases go, they put on a case that was not heavily refuted by the defense. Now, I don't know what the defense is going to do, but the, the, the witnesses that the prosecution presented were not heavily refuted. So that testimony stands and they established that you know he died because there was a knee on his neck and where if it were not for that fact he would still be alive so that to me is very strong now we go in to see what 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 what, what defense he has yeah the echo charles and charles is being modest he wrote an excellent column uh, just this week on this precise issue i'm about to bring up but the you know, the case for the prosecution rests on two things, right? They had to first make this argument that George Floyd died because Chauvin's knee was on his neck, not because of drugs, not because of his heart condition, but because of the knee on his neck. Mr. Derek Chauvin betrayed this badge when he used excessive and unreasonable force upon the body of Mr. George Floyd that he 
put his knees upon his neck and his back, grinding and crushing him until the very breath, no ladies and gentlemen, until the very life were squeezed out of him. Second point, and this was crucial, and this came out in a lot of the testimony we saw, was they have to deal with the objective reasonableness standard that the United States of America under the, the Graham Connor ruling that police officers are judged based on were their actions objectively, would they be object, uh, objectively reasonable to another officer? That another dispassionate officer, might they make the same decisions? Understanding that police officers do in fact find themselves in scenarios and have to make decisions that the average person does not, right? Now, now that said, that was one of the reasons we saw such a parade of policing experts, uh, the chief, training folks, sergeants, and with each time that they that one that a sworn officer sat in the stand and said, "I would not have done that. That was too far. He should not have done that." Was another officer, an objectively reasonable officer, saying, "No, this isn't something that makes sense. No, this isn't something that any of us would do." Continue to apply that level of force to a person proned out, handcuffed behind their back, um, that that in no way, shape, or form is anything that um, uh, is by policy, is not part of our training, and it is certainly not part of our ethics or our values. Now, it'll be really interesting to see how many police officers or training experts and types the defense tries to put up to kind of counter that argument. Uh, but, though, but those, I think, were the key points. And what I will say is uh, it, it was clear that the prosecutors here understood legally what it is they needed to do. Will it be effective? Not necessarily. Who knows? Right. But that is important. Uh, when you look back at the Rodney King trial, for example, uh, the prosecutors in that case brought a very narrow case. It was very specific about when exactly it crossed the line. And we're not going to talk about all this other stuff. And we're going to. And what we're seeing here is that these prosecute. And, and you go to the Trayvon Martin case, where many have argued it was an overcharged case to begin with. And that set them up for the acquittal at the end. Right? This has been a case where. In the courtroom, the prosecution's case has been specific, and it's been specifically tailored to the law that governs police officers. And from where I sit, that uh, that's extremely important. We, you would hope that was always the case, but we know that is not always the case. These are remarkably complicated legal issues, and I think the prosecution certainly has zeroed in on the ones that are most important if a jury is going to follow its instructions and dispassionately make a ruling. I think they've made a strong argument. Uh, we'll let you have the final word on that. Charles, thank you so much for your time. Uh, a reminder to everyone watching, uh, Charles has a new book out right now, The Devil You Know, A Black Power Manifesto. We have covered it extensively um, on Run Tell This, so please go check out our archive. We have a great episode with Charles about his book. It is a fantastic book, so please uh, buy it if, and read it if you haven't already. Charles, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. See you soon, Charles. Thank you guys for watching. Please check out BET's YouTube channel for more of our special coverage of the Chauvin trial. Please check out Run Tell This, where ever you listen to your podcast and on social media at runtellthis underscore.